All right, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a reading from the book of Sirach. O son, help your father in his old age. Do not grieve him as long as he lives. Even if he is lacking in understanding, show forbearance. In all your strength, do not despise him. For kindness to a father will not be forgotten. And against your sins, it will be credited to you. In the day of your affliction, it will be remembered in your favor. As frost in fair weather, your sins will melt away. Now we'll start with this prayer from John Paul's letter to the elderly. In ora mortis mei voca mei, et iube mei venire ad te. At the hour of my death, call me and bid me to come to you. Iube mei venire ad te. Command me to come to you. This is the deepest yearning of the human heart, even in those who are not conscious of it. Grant, O Lord of life, that we may be ever vividly aware of this and that we may savor every season of our lives as a gift filled with promise for the future. Grant that we may lovingly accept your will and place ourselves each day in your merciful hands. And when the moment of our definitive passage comes, grant that we may face it with serenity, without regret for what we shall leave behind. For in meeting you, after having sought you for so long, we shall find once more every authentic good which we he have known here on earth in the company of all who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith and hope. Mary, mother of pilgrim humanity, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. Keep us ever close to Jesus, your beloved son and our brother, the Lord of life and glory. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so this was at the request of a couple of parishioners who asked, they said, Father, could we have a series on aging? And I thought, sure, that would be, that would be, uh, would kind of be neat to do. Um, of course, the Bible and our faith has a lot to say on on all stages of life, but it certainly has a lot to reflect on with regard to, to older age. And of course, every stage of life is unique and is a gift of God that we're called to live out for his glory. Our culture, of course, tends to glorify youth and often look down upon old age. And of course, it's during the pandemic, being elderly is a special cross these days because of the isolation. So this is very uh, pertinent. But, you know, viewed from the, the lens of faith, of course, old age, even, even with its, all its challenges, is a special opportunity to glorify God. And so there's good reason to reflect over aging in the light of faith. Uh, for the elderly, in order to best live out this special stage and opportunity of life, for those who are younger, to prepare since of course all of us or most of us will get there soon enough and in order to best appreciate and serve and relate to those who are older than us so we'll have uh, this first meeting will be on understanding aging from a more scientific standpoint our second meeting will be a discussion so we'll involve all of you i'll sort of leave the discussion but i'd like to hear from a lot of the you who are older, what the blessings, the challenges, the things that help. So we'll do that next week. And I'll also maybe reflect a little bit on this beautiful book called Blessed by Our Brokenness by a Benedictine sister. And then the last week, we'll have Father Giles lead us on John Paul II's letter to the elderly and his own reflections over the topic. So tonight, we're very happy to have Rafael Fernandez to talk about old age. So I'm gonna let him introduce himself and uh, I'll hand you over to him now. So welcome, Raphael. Hi everybody, my name is Rafael Fernandez, but um, since my dad and my grandfather have the same name, everyone usually calls me Rafi. So feel free to call me that as well. 
Um, I'm a parishioner like you all um, with my wife and my uh, seven month old daughter, Anne. And uh, I uh, just want to give you a little background of who I am too. So I'm, a, I'm an MD PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, which means I'm both pursuing a doctorate in medicine as well as a uh, doctorate in science. Um, it just so happens that my doctorate in science is focused on trying to understand an aspect of aging. There are kids that have premature aging syndromes and I'm trying to help uncover new ways to treat the things that they get sick with. Um, and so I'm in the process right now of writing up my thesis to defend that and I'll go back to the hospital very soon to rejoin the medical school and kind of eventually, maybe I'll be treating some of you, who knows. Um, but yeah, that's sort of who I am and uh, what I do. So very, let me share my screen real quick. Um, uh, Father Hyacinth, can you allow me to share my screen? You may have to make me a presenter. Yes, I have to find you first. <laughs> Raphael, where are you? There you are, okay. There you go. Great, thank you. All right, so can everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. So I just wanted to give a, a short primer on what we know in the space of biology with regards to aging. Um, as someone who's only 30 years old, I can't speak to all of the experiences of aging, whether you be whatever age you might be. Um, we each have our own experience with this, but there have been a lot, there's been a lot of scientists and a lot of physicians really interested in trying to address the, what they consider the problem of aging, which I'll sort of define more. We'll talk a little bit about how we've come to understand what aging is. And we'll talk very briefly a little bit about sort of what physicians and we individually can do to sort of age better. Um, and when I say better, I'm just talking about it from a biological standpoint, not necessarily from a um, uh, spiritual or, or psychological standpoint, even though I think those this things are the, very important. Is, no, uh, is, just some housekeeping things before we get going. So this is just for information. Um, I'm not a physician, so anything I say is not covered by a doctor-patient relationship. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to Dr. Peter Atia, who helped kind of frame this talk really well. Um, and I'll reference his original talk, which you should all definitely watch. I think it's really a great encapsulation of a lot of really exciting work that's been done over the past 20, 30 years. Um, and I just ask that you please place your questions in the chat and hold them and I'll address them at the end. I think that's gonna be the most efficient way uh, on Zoom to be able to address each one of um, your questions. So before uh, we jump into actual aging, I wanted to sort of start with a brief little movie interlude to make a point about science in general and biology in general, which I think will be important for us to keep in mind as we sort of start understanding more and more about aging through this talk. So, this was a movie that was put together by Charles and Ray Eames um, at the behest of IBM back in the 70s. And uh, I first saw it at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Um, and I've seen it in high school and I watch it regularly because I think it's a great encapsulation of a principle that I'll summarize in a moment. So. Thank you. 
near the lakeside in Chicago was the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now, every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide. So I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit because this, what this movie does, which is so awesome, is it goes all the way to the edge of the known universe and then goes all the way back down to the edge of the known universe at the smallest scale as well. Um, I'm not someone at all capable of talking about the cosmos, um, but so that's why we'll just skip ahead real quick so you, we can see the parts that I am qualified to talk about. So here we go. Two, one, we are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, 10 to the zero power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus two, one one hundredth of a meter, one centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin, crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn, an outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself, a molecule like a long twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters, the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space at last, the carbon nucleus, so massive and so small. This carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks in intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or one and 40 zeros. So the reason I really like showing this video is because it captures something um, that I think is lost um, the further and deeper you get into science, which is this sense of wonder um, at how the world exists with all of these different um, processes all happening at the different scales of 10, whether it be at the cosmic level or at the subatomic level or at any of the levels in between. And that's just something that we, we lose a lot when we communicate science oftentimes. Uh, so I just wanna leave that with you when, as we start, cause we're gonna get sort of very precise very quickly and we don't wanna lose sight of just how amazing it all is. The other aspect of this video that I really like is that it helps give us a sense for the scales that we're talking about when we talk about different um, things in biology. 
which matter. And the other thing is to remember that at every scale, something might happen, either break or fix, but that is interconnected to all the other levels above and below it. Um, for example, there's the organism, the human being, and then there's organ systems like organs, your lungs, your liver, your blood. And then there are cells and tissues, and those are like the next level down. And then there are molecules and subcellular parts that are all at the next level. And if you keep going down all the way to atoms, when we start talking about aging, it's really important to remember where we are in this and how they all interrelate. Um, and frankly, we don't know all of the different connections that exist. Uh, the next thing I just wanna say as a general point is that uh, I've been working in science for I think about 13, 14 years. Um, and every time I study either medicine or some aspect of biology, uh, this principle always comes up. And it's pretty simple. We've all learned it from the, uh, the uh, fairy tale of our youth, um, but it's really true that a lot of biology and frankly, probably a lot of aging has to do with trying to keep things just right. And it's amazing the systems that exist in our bodies that allow us to live for as long as we do um, without things falling all apart. Um, so I just leave you with those kind of two starting principles um, just to kind of remember and keep in the back of our mind as we start talking more and more about actually what is aging. All right, enough preamble, let's get started. So, this talk is broken up into the three parts, like I mentioned. Let's talk about aging and why physicians and scientists are so excited about trying to understand it and to delay what we mean by aging. That's not to say that it's not good to get old, but rather I think all of, anyone who I've talked to who has been old has always told me, you know, it would be nice if I could be a little younger. And I don't think that they mean that they wanna, they, you know, they, I idolize being younger necessarily, but rather I think it's a way of saying, well, it would be nice if I could do, I could have a 15 year old's body now that I, I understand more about the world. Um, so the way scientists and, and physicians have kind of broken this down is two words that I'm gonna define here. And the first is lifespan. Very simply, it's from the day you're born to the day you die you die. That's the time that we have here on this earth. Um, but then there's another term here called health span, which you can think of as the time on earth where you're able to healthily live well in the world. And so we're going to actually define that more in the coming slides as we sort of talk about what the goal of aging research is and what physicians are trying to do when they're trying to address aging. So if we draw the curve here of mapping out lifespan and health span, and this is what a normal human being might experience, you know, you're born and over time you're developing as a child and eventually around middle age, you reach a pinnacle of sort of the pinnacle of your health. You sort of have great cognitive function. You're able to react to the world. You're able to engage with the world. You're able to live life. But as time goes on, aging starts to catch up with you. And the main point I wanna make here is at that pinnacle, the change in the first couple of five, 10 years after the pinnacle, you really won't notice it. It's very small, but aging is a relentless process. It's a, like compounding interest. It will just continue and continue to work on your body. And over time will essentially cause all of the parts of your body to essentially stop working as well as they used to. So by studying aging and understanding what are the actual components of it at all the different levels of biology, we might be able to essentially extend health span uh, and live a life that's more fulfilling here on earth um, and be able to act out our role that God has for us for longer. That might essentially have the unintended consequences of also living longer. But I think if you're just trying to pursue lifespan extension, I think even people who aren't 
Catholic will tell you that they don't think that that's a good idea. Um, so this is just a simple thing of trying to understand that I think most of aging research's goal is to address health span because, and the other reason for that is that almost all of the diseases that we suffer from, the major risk factor that we have not really addressed well as a medical community is aging. You know, we've addressed smoking, we've addressed other things that definitely, and other uh, exposures that definitely predispose you to getting sick, but uh, we still don't really have good treatments for sort of addressing this age problem with uh, certain diseases. So what, what can we think of as, what, what does good extending health span look like? How do, how do we want to do that? The way I think about it is that there's sort of two ways. There's offense and defense. Um, and here we can think of it as defense, as avoiding disease. And there's really these four horsemen of death in the modern developed world. And that's heart disease and stroke, which are actually caused basically by the same fundamental biological process gone awry, just depends on where and how it all kind of ends up going. Um, cancer, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, so that's uh, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, all of those are sort of under another category. And then accidents, this is 80% of the causes of death in the world, period. Uh, so if we can find ways to avoid these diseases or at least improve our treatment of them, we can live healthier lives and uh, more productive in the sense of enjoying life. On the opposite side, we can think of playing offense, which is what does it mean to healthily age? What does it mean to be a healthy elderly person? Um, and I think we can break it down into three components, that being uh, mind, body, and soul. And under each one of those, we can sort of define them more clearly. Under mind, if we want to be more precise, um, we can say, okay, it's, you first have to have a pretty decent short-term memory because you have to be able to interact with the world around you and understand and see things and remember them at least for a short period of time so that you can then engage with them, think about them, mull them over. Um, and that's where the processing comes in. If you have good processing ability of all of those concepts, that's a good healthy mind. And the last one is executive function, which is a fancy term that I like to say is about emotional regulation. It's your ability to sort of regulate yourself, realize your limits. Um, that's something that we really only gain when we hit 25, 26. Um, so that's definitely something that eventually is lost, but that's a, a really important part of kind of having a very clear and crisp mind as we age. In terms of the body, we can break it down into having muscle mass. Uh, that's one of the hallmark features of, um, of aging is losing muscle mass. And that is important because it helps you move, but it also has other implications with your metabolism and managing all sorts of aspects of your body's health that we don't, we haven't all fully appreciated yet, especially in the medical community. The second part is function, which I mean simply to say the act of walking, getting up, the activities that you do day in and day out. It's the simple act of reaching for something and feeling confident that you're not going to stumble or that you're not going to uh, trip. These are uh, useful things to be that, that help people to live well. And the sec last one of this sort of category is freedom from pain. Um, I, as a medical student, I've seen people in a lot of pain and I can tell you, having been in pain myself, your mind is not your own if you are in pain or in chronic pain. So if we can remove that from the, that's not to say that it, pain isn't or suffering isn't of value in and of itself, um, or that there's not some value in when people can only suffer. But if you can alleviate pain, trust me, it's something you want to be able to do. And the last part is soul. Um, and I think we all have a very clear sense of what our purpose is, given that our faith provides that. Um, but social support is also really important. And it's great that our faith really uh, 
enshrines that in one of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which is to visit with the elderly. I think that's a very important one. Um, and it really helps to kind of keep people healthy as they age. The last one in this is I call happiness and grit because the reality is that life is just hard. And so we have to sort of hold on and, and, and uh, really kind of power through some of the things that sometimes are just really hard to do. Okay, so that I think kind of delineates, I think how scientists and physicians are thinking about aging and how to, what our goal is for everybody. It's either to kind of stay the four horsemen or try to find ways to foster a uh, way to actually age better. So now I wanna talk a little bit about you know, what, how we've come to learn uh, what aging is actually, and uh, what we, and, my, and it'll offer clues for us to understand what we might be able to do about that. I'm gonna give you three vignettes. Um, the first looking at humans, the next one looking at animals, and the last one sort of looking at cells, tissues, molecules. So a bunch of people thought, you know, if you're gonna study aging, let's find the people who live the longest. And if we study them, we'll start to understand uh, what are the things that help you to live longer. And so if we study centenarians, these are people who are over a hundred years old, what we find is that really doesn't matter what they do, it matters who their parents were. So genes, your genetics really pre basically dictate whether or not you're gonna to live to 100 years old. And some people might say, well, Rafi, why, why are there now so many more centenarians nowadays? Well, I would say that that's because we're really good, at least in developed countries, to treat um, a lot of the diseases that would have prevented people who had those genes to make it to 100 years old. So we're not sort of uncovering the fact that people can live to 100 years old. Uh, What's really interesting is when you look at the list of genes that are found in centenarians, um, they're all related to the diseases of the four horsemen. I mean, not accidents per se, but they're all related to affecting heart disease, stroke, cancer, or neurodegenerative diseases. And so it's fascinating that really, it, that just studying this group of people that live long, you can already sort of see um, a connection with the four horsemen and sort of strengthens the case that we really should address those diseases if we're gonna see, if we're gonna wanna live healthier and sort of as a side effect longer. Next, I think it's good to sort of talk about mice and all the other animals that uh, uh, scientists spend a lot of time studying and the reason we study animals is because it's actually a lot easier to do uh, an aging experiment in, uh, in mice. Uh, doing it in humans would be ethically complicated and also really expensive because it would take 80, 90 years to fully feel like you did the study well. Um, and it's just really complicated to study human aging per se. But with animals, we can, some animals like worms live for 21 days. So we can manipulate them in certain ways and we'll have an answer within a couple of weeks. Uh, mice live about two to three years, but there are other animals that people study like monkeys that live for decades. So frankly, it's been a really fruitful um, endeavor to sort of use these systems to understand aging. And the things that come out of them that work in almost every, pretty much every single animal that we've looked at are the things that are on this slide. So one of the interesting things is caloric restriction, which is basically not starvation, but a reduction in the amount of energy and from food that we give animals. That extends lifespan from worms to mice to monkeys. So it's very clear that there's something about being just a little bit starved. I'm not saying starved, like malnourished, but just a little bit. Not, and that really helps to sort of extend lifespan in an interesting way. There are these drugs that I have listed on here, rapamycin and metformin. I mentioned them just so that you've heard of them. 
Um, they also extend lifespan in multiple different animals. Um, the mechanism by which they do that is complicated uh, because there is no one single answer for that. We can definitely see that they extend life, but how they do it, since they, these are drugs that attack very central processes to many uh, animals and cells, it's really hard to tease apart which one of them is the most important one. And so there's a lot of work kind of trying to tease that apart, figure that out ongoing, but we still don't know. And the last part is that we can actually replicate many of the things we found in centenarians in these animal models. And it's wonderful to see that that still holds true. So we're really starting to understand that there are these very clearly genetic factors that allow you to age well, um, but there are things you can do like caloric restriction, like take some of these drugs that can extend lifespan and inevitably also health span usually. A caveat though with all of this is anything that you do can oftentimes have issues at other levels. So um, something that might be good for your liver or might you know, improve liver aging, so to speak, might be bad for your lungs. And so it's important to always remember that while these are true for animals, it's, we can extend it to humans, but we're not 100% sure that it will always work there. So we come to the last part, which is the smallest aspect of what I wanted to talk about, which is sort of a hodgepodge of different things, either cells or molecules and how they sort of interrelate. Um, I think these are also very important. Um, they're just not necessarily as clear cut yet what to do about them. So for example, let's talk about mitochondria, which are the energy power, they're the, the, uh, the power plant of every cell. Every uh, animal cell and plant cell has these little tiny organelles, which are depicted in the bottom left-hand corner here. Um, and they provide the energy for life. Um, as you get older, those, uh, those uh, power, factories really don't do as well and start behaving oddly. Uh, and so if there would be a way to sort of improve their health, which there are some uh, supplements that people have sort of are exploring, it might be a really beneficial way to sort of extend the health span of individuals. So inflammation is an interesting broad category that can cover a lot of different things. And I bring this up just to sort of highlight the Goldilocks principle here. Um, inflammation is your immune system. It's your immune system's response to an invading foe like a virus uh, or a bacteria. Uh, and having lots of it going on all the time can be a bad thing. So it's useful when you're infected with something, but if it's on all the time, it actually can cause a lot of damage and is associated with aging. On the flip side, as you get older, your immune system gets worse. So it's this too much of a good thing is a bad thing, too little of it is also bad. Um, there are many complicated uh, stories you can tell about how inflammation relates to, inflammation relates to aging. Um, another aspect that's really important is insulin and sugar management. So if anyone's a diabetic, they think about this day in and day out, but it's very, very clear that as we age, all of us sort of have issues with managing sugar uh, that we didn't have when we were younger. And what's fascinating about this is it sort of underlies a lot of the biology in the diseases of the four horsemen, particularly um, heart disease and stroke. Uh, so it's very clear that people who are diabetic are at much, much higher risk for heart disease and stroke. And so it really kind of ties a lot of this together um, and really is an interesting thing that people are still trying to fully understand and chase down. The last one, which is sort of near and dear to my heart, because that's sort of what my PhD is on, is looking at stem cell and tissue health. And that's sort of represented by the picture in the bottom right-hand corner um, which is a picture of, a, of normal skin. And what you can see at the top is sort of a, a layer of dead cells which protects you from the outdoor environment. And then there's layers of cells that are in either the process of dying or in the process of sort of 
dividing to replace the dead cells that are being lost. And if we go further and further down to the bottom layer of cells down at, with those where those purple dots are, um, there's likely a stem cell there. And that cell is the stem cell because it replaces all of the other cells in that tissue. It's very clear that as we studied people who are elderly, that there are problems with the stem cells in replacing the cells of the tissue. And that leads to issues with lots with the function of the tissue. So by doing that, you end up with organ dysfunction and eventually human body dysfunction, which is an issue. So if we can find ways to either help improve the tissue health or improve the stem cell health, that might be a benefit in extending a health span and also addressing some of these four horsemen issues. So the last part of the talk, which is probably the shortest one, is um, what we can do. And I'm not here to sell some sort of magic elixir or to tell you that there is a fountain of youth because there is not. And anyone who's selling that is um, crazy. Uh, so to that end though, I've broken it down. I think it's simply do what your mother told you to do when you were young. And that has to do with eating well. I think frankly, as we have a diet that usually promotes overeating in general. So if we can, eat a little less, not to starvation, but a little less can be super helpful in terms of helping to age more gracefully. Um, exercise is really important for a couple of reasons. Muscle mass to keep maintain that is really useful, but also as you exercise, you have that functional capacity to do things, to walk with confidence, to not uh, fall. Um, these are all things that people are get worried about as we age. And so if we're stronger for it, we're better balanced, we're able to sort of age better. Sleep. Um, sleep is actually extremely important and affects lots of different um, diseases. It's very much tied to the four horsemen. And if the, of the four horsemen, particularly uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration, it's intimately linked with that people who don't sleep enough are at much, much higher risk for developing dementia and other things. Now, that being said, it also is subject to the Goldilocks principle. About eight hours a night is what we should be shooting for as adults. Changes depending on if you're a child um, and you know if you're tired, it's okay to sleep a little more. But in general, we should always shoot for something on the order of about eight hours as adults. Um, and because if you sleep more, that's actually been shown to be at least associated with more disease. Um, and if you sleep less, that's definitely been shown to actually cause issues very similar to disease. The last one is distress tolerance, which is sort of this executive function grit kind of a thing. Um, it's about sort of being able to, being ready to explore new things. Um, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for everyone. Um, keeping that up is hard, but uh, I think having our faith and having a good prayer life really uh, will strengthen that aspect. So if you sort of, this is the stuff that's very much in all of our control if we sort of are, want to age more gracefully. Uh, but there's also other things that are coming online like drugs, supplements, and hormones, and I'm sure there are many, many um, news articles that are gonna be published within many weeks um, about the most recent new idea that will help prevent aging in some way, shape or form. Um, I'm not going to comment on those things. Uh, that's complicated and we'd be here all night. Uh, the simple thing I'll say in terms of things you should take is if your physician is prescribing you a drug because you have some one aspect of the four horsemen, or you uh, need a drug for a certain uh, ailment, you should take it. Um, please have a conversation with your physician to understand why it's important. But um, I think it's really important to take those medications because it really helps address and keep at bay those diseases that are sort of going to impair the, the function of all of us. Um, Supplements and hormones are, comp are more complicated. Um, they, 
I'm not, that's not me saying that they don't work and that some supplements won't be useful and that they, that I'm not poo-pooing them out of hand. I think people just like to sort of latch onto them and say, well, this is really, really good um, when they read something in the news or, uh, and it's, it's funny to me because sometimes there are supplements that have some research behind them, but it's more of a marketing thing to sort of say, hey, we're trying to sell this supplement. So it's, it's always something to be a little more wary about. The more important thing to think about is, and always is if you take a supplement, it's totally fine. Um, just make sure you keep track of it because it does, those things do interact with drugs and can cause other issues um, going forward. So that's, I think, the limit of what I want to say on what you should do about aging. Um, it's pretty much the thing I would really focus on if it was me and what I do for my own life and I'm trying to teach my, my daughter is the simple things of eating a good, healthy, balanced diet, exercising on a regular basis, getting enough sleep, and really ensuring that we have a good prayer life and a good um, set of social support that we're looking for. Um, in our, in our faith with God and the rest of the world. So I'll leave you with just two resources. Um, so Dr. Peter Atia, uh, which, on which this talk is largely based, has a great website with tons of podcasts, articles, videos. Um, if you really are interested in sort of the basic biology of aging, he does a great job of breaking down really complicated things into very clear and simple um, terms for all of us to understand. Um, it's actually been really helpful for me because I, you know, I focus on a very narrow aspect of aging and just kind of getting a bigger, broader sense of that. It's been really helpful to have his, his work together. The other is Dr. Nir Barzilai's book. So Dr. Barzilai um, is up in New York he is the head of the Center for Aging. I want to say it, Albert Einstein. I've seen him talk. He gives an, he gives an awesome, fascinating talk on uh, centenarians. That's his main research. Um, he just came out with a book. I think it was last year or this year. Um, I have not read it, but I looked at the table of contents and it looked really, really good. Um, I wanted to read it. So I figured I'd share that with you all. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you for giving me the time to to just kind of give you a lay of the land of what we know about aging uh, from a biological standpoint. Um, and I'm excited to sort of answer your questions. All right, thanks a lot, Rachel. So why don't we go ahead and move to the questions. So um, we have some questions in the chat, so you can always throw things there, but you can also, uh, you can just chime in if you have a question you want to chime in for. So just remember to unmute yourself because I think most of you are muted. <laughs> Hi, Father Hyacinth, this is mom and dad. <laughs> How you doing? Hello. <laughs> Great talk, uh, excellent talk. Um, I'm getting, uh, I'm having them freeze up. Am I freezing up? We can yeah. hear you again now though. But, uh, one thing I was going to say is if, if health is everything, you hear this said so often, uh, with terms, you know, the, the age uh, that you are is not necessarily uh, uh, an indicator of how happy you are, uh, uh, how functional you are in life, it's your health. And if you lose your health, uh, you, or you, you have just the basic things or a, a chore and uh, whatever, it changes everything. Then all of a sudden becoming older is, is almost incapacitating. So it's, that's something else to keep in mind to keep yourself fit. Uh, as doctor says, 
and uh, both mind and body, spirituality, uh, uh, exercise, a reasonable amount of exercise and so forth. So you can, uh, you can have your other functions uh, to rely on. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really important thing to sort of put in the time before, uh, you know, it kind of compounds to a point where it becomes way too hard to kind of keep yourself fit and healthy and, and it pays off. Um, but, you know, we're trying to understand more to kind of address the issues that I sort of laid out and it's important to, to do that. Yeah, I hear you. It's a real, it's a real issue. That's why I, I got interested in this. Actually, if I can just chime in as well. Um, so a lot of times we, there's a lot written on this, but a lot of times uh, we don't really talk about it much as Christians is what's the relationship between health and faith or health and virtue, health and holiness. And, you know, on the one hand, people can idolize health as if it's the most important, it's a, as if it's God or the most important thing in life. Yeah. Or you can, on the other hand, you know, you can discard it and not, and, and neither, neither is right. There's, we've talked about the golden mean, right. And, but if the way I think about it is actually connected the, to the virtue of temperance. So temperance is all about having the right levels and you can allot it with a lot of things. You can go off either in two different directions by excess or defect. But there's this, and it's not just the middle way that is often the best where you get the right amount, but it's also an ideal, it's actually a peak. Um, so it's not mediocrity. The middle way is not mediocrity. It's actually kind of difficult to, to get that. Um, not to talk too much or not to talk too little. You know, and you can go on through lots of different categories, but with health, it's kind of similar as well. I think, um, but it's actually, it's actually a virtue um, to not, I mean, one of the ways we are not healthy is by seeking, inst by instant gratification, by seeking pleasure for its own sake. 100%. Um, pleasure has, a, has, is, it has an important role, but it's supposed to be rooted in a deeper good or order to a higher good. We often get into trouble by seeking pleasure over the good that it's rooted in. Instead of taking pleasure in the good, we're kind of bypassing the good and seeking the good and the pleasure in a detached way. And that's going to often have an effect on our health. In the short term, we might feel some pleasure, but in the long term, we're going to have feel the effects of it. But it takes some discipline um, to and self-mastery. It's hard. It's hard, hard for all of us to choose the, the long-term good over the short-term good, the deeper good over the more shallow good, and so on. But that's, that's very much related to temperance, self-control, self-mastery, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that's a good way of summing up the, the Goldilocks principle of, from biology into sort of moral living and healthy living to some extent. Um, I think somebody in the chat uh, wanted to ask about the benefits of a vegan or a vegetarian diet, which is a great question. Um, so, Diet is one of the sciences that is very much a, uh, it's, it's hard to make definitive pronouncements about anything um, and feel 100% confident that you won't be made a fool in a week uh, because there's a lot of information that's complicated. Um, for certain diseases, I can tell you for a fact, like, cardiovascular disease particularly, and probably stroke as well, although I don't know the data for stroke. A vegetarian and a vegan diet is um, particularly good for preventing that. Now, does that mean that everyone should be a vegetarian? No, I don't think that. Um, can you get the benefits of that people see in a vegetarian diet and get the protective benefit um, for cardiovascular disease? Yes, um, that sort of emerged from some of the early centenarian work where they thought that the Mediterranean diet was really important. Um, I know that that's sort of a little more complicated than I'm able to expound on. So to answer your question, there are some benefits. Um, is it a benefit for everything? N not that it's been shown yet is the way I would say that. 
Rafi, if I could just chime in really quick, because I actually eat a vegan diet. <laughs> That's but, good. But one, one, one good work for that is there's a book called by Dr. Michael Greger called How Not to Die. And it's not, it's a funny title. It's he's not telling you how not to die as if you're not going to die. It's that you're going to die, but there's certain ways that are, you know, a good way to die and not other ways that are not so good. But the whole, the whole first half of the book, he basically summarizes the science of nutrition related to all these different diseases that are our top pillars. And he also has a website, nutritionfacts.org. But what's really good about him, he's, he follows the science and he shows you where all the studies are. He also shows you what you can say with confidence and so on. So yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's the a lot. I, I just, I worry because the issue with, with nutrition science in general, and this is not to dock people who do it because it's, it's hard to do well. It's just that there's, there's always a lot of issues with it. And that's not for me to say that there isn't great things that have been discovered. I just, I'm always, I, I personally am very careful with it because it's so, it's, it's complicated. Um, so the good thing about him is he, and, and their organization is they don't take any industry funding. They look at all the meta studies. They look at all the studies. They actually research every single article in nutrition and they also know the weight of the evidence. They say, how certain can we be of this or that? They're very cautious as well. That's good. So that's a good nutritionfacts.org. It's all free. That's also good. Um, any comments on supplements that people seem to be taking that are actually causing harm? It's a great question. Um, none in particular that come off the top of my head. The main one that I, so, there are a lot, there are lots of supplement studies. The issue is that they're, the issue is that, that again, the science is complicated. It's who's funding the supplement studies. There's really not a lot of money for them to, to, to study supplements. So a lot of it comes from trials that are more for marketing. Um, the main example that's given in medical school frequently is this tea called St. John's wort. I'm not telling anybody to stop taking it. But it's important to mention that to your physician because it has many interactions with many drugs. Um, and so it's a way to make sure that those drugs are still being useful, even if you're taking that, um, that tea. Another question I got in the chat, is there any way to prevent Alzheimer's disease? Um, not that we know of at the moment. That being said, the thing that tracks with your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease pretty strongly is lack of sleep. So if I was a betting man, getting good amount of sleep every night is gonna really be the best thing you can do to prevent uh, getting Alzheimer's disease. If it's something you can do to do that. So that I can definitely say. Actually, Rafi, um, could you maybe say a little bit? Of, uh, can you can you talk a little bit about the telomeres? Oh, sure. So I, I didn't touch on telomeres. Um, that's what I study uh, in the lab, um, and it's the ends of uh, your chromosomes. So in our in our body, the DNA is broken up into twenty three pairs of what are called chromosomes. They're just pieces of DNA that are uh, that incorporate all of our genes. And at the ends of those chromosomes are these things called telomeres that are very long when we are young and as we age, get shorter. And uh, there's, it's work that's uh, yielded the Nobel Prize back in 2009 for uh, the work of discovering that these things exist. And then also the enzyme called telomerase, which is a protein that basically extends them. So in certain aspects of our body, our telomeres aren't getting as short as in other parts and particularly the stem cells themselves. So that, those, that's sort of how our body is able to even function for 80 years. So we, all of, some of our cells have just enough to kind of keep the telomeres long enough that our body still functions. But even still, it's not enough. They get short, they cause damage to much of our, uh, they drive a lot of the tissue uh, damage that we see um, and so, you know, work in our lab and in others is trying to understand what so that damage is and also 
um, what we can do to help support those stem cells and kind of help to fix those telomeres. So Susan says, it seems that people who continue to work or live with a purpose seem to be more mentally sharp and active and cannot refer to specific studies. And frankly, I 100% agree with you, Susan. I think it's a really important fact and I think we should definitely keep that in mind. Um, I see my dad uh, referencing the uh, life balance and the rule of, of Benedict, which I also heartily recommend. Um, and then another question about how to track and analyze metrics and when you make changes to your lifestyle. I think it's, uh, as a scientist, I like measuring things. I like measuring how long I sleep. I like measuring what I eat. Um, if you like that, that's good. You don't have to. I, you can build, like Father Hyacin sort of, sort of mentioned briefly, if you can build habits that are virtuous, then you sort of don't have to think about those things day in and day out, and it can help a lot. But, um, you know, I think keeping a simple, a simple uh, spreadsheet is totally good enough for a little book, writing it down in a little book can be totally good to kind of make sure you're following those things. I, I just wanted to ask a question. Jim, I think you just accidentally muted yourself. There we go. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question about, um, talked about lack of sleep being something that could cause all kinds of other problems. And I think with especially older people, uh, lack of sleep, it's, it's not a, a case of, you know, uh, uh, a two-year-old waking up in the middle of the night or working late for work or, and, and having to get up early the following morning, it's other things that encroach on one's sleep. You have plenty of time to sleep, but I think older folks sometimes just don't sleep well. Um, any thoughts on people that have enough time to sleep, but uh, for whatever reason, um, things encroach upon their being able to have a, a good long, eight hours, as you, as you suggest. Yeah, so as, as we get older, it becomes harder to sleep well. It just, that's true. So there's a little bit of it, you're sort of fighting a losing battle trying to do that. Um, I mean, the main thing is to not take sleep, uh, sleeping aids or sleeping pills particularly. Those don't have been shown very clearly. They knock you out, but they do not promote actual sleep, the thing that's gonna be helpful. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard because it's after that, at, at some point, your body is always just going to be needing less and less sleep as you get older. But it's, it, so it's a hard cycle. The best thing that I always say is simple sleep hygiene is a good starting point. So um, going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, um, very simple, actually a little hard to do, uh, but definitely a really good thing that helps promote good sleep. Um, keeping the room dark and cold to fall asleep in, even though it's sometimes nice to get under the covers and feel kind of warm, um, your body needs to actually cool itself a couple of degrees to initiate sleep. So um, that's another thing that can help sort of promote sleep and help you get closer to sleeping more. Even though I totally hear what you're saying, it's really hard. And as you get older, it just, it just is harder to do. Um, but you know, those simple habits can really, um, compound over time. Yeah. Doctor, another thing too, with, uh, as far as men are concerned, getting up and going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, 
prostate issues, that, that type of thing is a real concern. I hear you completely. For, for a lot of men. I, so yeah, I hear you completely and I, I, I get it. It's not fun. And, you know, there are things we can take to help with that. Um, it's, it's hard. It's sort of, once it's, once we're at that point, it's, we're, we're sort of at the limit of what we, what we're able to sort of do. So I hear you. It's not fun. That doesn't help. Can I jump in with a quick question? Sure. Hi, Rafi. Thank you for a great, great talk. And, and hi, everybody. Lovely to see you. Um, I, my, my question is a kind of philosophical. I, I had a um, former colleague in the medical ethics department at Penn, um, Kara Fallon. She's now at Yale. She, she's writing this history of um, aging science, and she's found that there's been this really interesting shift in how the scientific community thinks about aging sort of philosophically. And, and um, one of the things that she's finding is that previously the model was that kind of the lifespan was a bell curve. So in the early years of formation, you became more and more of a healthy, full person. Uh, you started to depend less on your mother, your parents, et cetera, you could be more independent. And that kind of peaked a few decades in and then your health just started to decline, right? And now um, kind of both science and I suppose society has shifted into thinking that uh, the goal is not to accept that graduate decline, but rather to just extend the peak, right? So that you, if you at your peak are running seven miles a day, you, the sort of scientific community wants you to keep running that seven miles a day for decades, or rather society certainly wants this and, and science kind of reflects maybe the, that position. Um, until, I don't know, you, one day after your, after your six, seven miles of running, you just kind of drop dead and, and die and you, your health has not suffered um, that decline. Uh, you know, obviously that's related to like broader, a broader sort of secular philosophical shift on the nature of, of life and death. But the question that I have for you, um, this is sort of a very long-winded introduction, but the question I have for you is just like, as a scientist, um, if you see that shift, um, is there kind of an attempt to push peak performance um, at the expense of developing science that instead sort of embraces and accepts declining health over time? Uh, so it's a great question. I think, and I agree with you as somebody who's sort of been in the field for a little bit of time. Um, there's very clearly, I think, a group of scientists out at, um, out sort of that are part of Google and uh, Facebook. I think they've invested a lot in these companies that really are focused on sort of immortality which is not something that we've ever really been thinking about um, from the standpoint of aging for a long time. Um, so those guys are definitely sort of different from the rest of the field. Uh, there have always been a couple people who sort of thought that, but they were always seen as a little bit strange. Um, that's becoming more mainstream. Um, I think it's foolish, frankly, um, because I think that they're sort of chasing after something that they're not going to like in the end, um, and so I, you know, I sort of presented it very clinically and very coldly of sort of like this is what it is, and I sort of tried to remove a little bit of what my sense is. Uh, frankly, I think there's there's room for lots of work to always be thinking of how we can age the way that and I sort of let it slip is age gracefully. Um, I I don't think of it as. Um, you know, we need to be productive and we need to sort of be um, healthy so that we can produce for society. Uh, but rather, I think it's more of centered around our own faith of saying, okay, what, what's my role in this world that God's put me here for? And does my health then allow me to then get to those things? Um, and so, you know, addressing the suffering that people have that is of no fault of their own is a benefit. And since age just plays into all of that, I think that's where a lot, I think there's a really fruitful, um, that's, that's the thing that's gonna sustain us longer term. Um, this chase for immortality, I think is foolish and will fall apart. And 
they're not doing well. <laughs> um, they're finding cool stuff, but they're not, uh, it, they're, I don't think they're any closer, so. And even if people were able to prevent all heart attacks, cancer and everything, there's still accidents. Exactly, so. <laughs> Eventually, something's going to get you. Yeah, yeah, no, I, there's a, a car accident. Three things in life are certain death, taxes, and lost data. So, <laughs> maybe just uh, one last comment or question before we uh, wrap I like, up. I would like to make a comment, okay? Um, what do you think the effect of this pandemic is having on the retired and older people? Um, I mean, the news about how susceptible Sorry, we, we somehow you just got muted. I will. Um, I, am I on? Okay. Yep. Did you get any of that? The just pandemic? You mentioned the news. The well, I said that the news puts a frightening aspect on the senior population, which causes them more isolation because we have fear of really going anywhere and interacting with people live and in person. Also, concepts like we're not going to do Thanksgiving the way we did Thanksgiving or Christmas. Young people will be very sad about that. But people who are older say, how many Christmases and Thanksgivings do I really have left? And one of them, I'm going to be isolated or I'm just going to have a friend because you're nervous to interact. So I don't know if I really have a question. It's more of a comment about um, how does maybe the doctor see the pandemic affecting not only the psychological health of, health of people, but the physiological health of people? Uh, that's, a, that's the million dollar question that uh, <laughs> if I could answer that completely, um, I think that, you know, I, I, I would have, I'd be a full professor and I'd have a lot, to, <laughs> I'd be much more advanced than I am right now. So I, I think what I'll say is that that's what I tried to make. I, I just want to make sure that I, I, I make that clear is that I really do think that while I try to focus on the biology of aging and like what it is and how we try to address it, um, I do think that, you know, our faith and our social networks and our support really do influence and um, support people as they age. And I think it's beautiful. And I, I think I made the comment before, but I really do think it's beautiful that um, one of the spiritual and corporal acts of mercy is to visit the elderly and the sick and the infirm. Um, and that's not to say that they're all the same thing. They're rather that they're sort of people that you should definitely visit with. Um, do I think that the pandemic has made that extremely hard? Yes. <laughs> do I think um, that there, that we can be creative in how we approach those things? Yes. I think that's, I think resigning ourselves to looking at life um, as it can only be one way does not offer the creativity that God has endowed each one of us to sort of help and live and, 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 and enjoy the, this world that he's given us and this time that he's given us together. So, you know, I would, I would just say that is be strong and, and resilient and adaptable and, and it will be very fun. Well, thanks a lot, Rafi. Um, I'll just mention, you mentioned a couple of resources. I'll just mention another one, which we were talking about is, some of you are familiar with the Great Courses kind of a, a website and they, they, they find good professors all over the, the country and then each of them you can sign up and, and learn a lot through their courses. So there's one called The Aging Brain, which I remember going through a little while ago that's, that's well done. So you, if, if you're interested in sort of the neurological aspect of aging. I think that's a good introduction and very interesting series. Um, so next week we're gonna, so this is kind of understanding the physiological and a little bit of the psychological, it's kind of the science behind aging and all of that. Next week, we're gonna sort of, pro, we're gonna have a discussion over all this. What's our experience? How do we process, process all of this through faith? How do we understand it? How do we make the best of it? And again, um, 
if any of you are able to, um, it might be, you know, if you ordered it at this point, you might not be able to get it in time and read the whole thing. It's, it's actually a thin, easy to read, but it's worth getting anyways, whether you're able to do it for next week or not. It's a beautiful, really beautiful book called Blessed by Our Brokenness um, that, that we'll refer to in our discussion next week by a Benedictine nun. I'm not sure if she's still living, but she talks about her own experience with old age and she goes through all kinds of different disabilities with a kind of a spiritual reflection over them all. So, and then I always, you can always check out John Paul II's letter to the elderly, which you can find online, which is very beautiful. And again, Father Giles will be talking about that on the, the last night. So thanks again, everyone. Let's just end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life and for all the seasons of life. We pray that you might help us to glorify you in every stage of life, wherever we find ourselves. We, help, we pray that you help all those who are elderly and are experiencing many limitations, pains, and challenges, that you might sustain, bless them, assure them of your love, uh, be with them, especially in this time of the pandemic. We pray that you might help uh, those of us who are younger to to appreciate those who are older, to reach out, to uh, try to learn from, and to serve in our own way. And we ask that you give us, that you provide us with all the grace we need to do your will in this next week. And we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of, of Almighty God come down upon us, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Father. Father. Blessed night, and we'll see you. Hope to see you next week. Thanks, Raphael. Thanks, Raphael. Thank you. Thanks.